right? So simple snacks, they manufacture one product and then they're using single process or a piece of coffee. And um, the information that we were given is for June 2013. The, the unit information that they gave us are as follows. Work in process, first of Je I mean, June, 20% has been completed. Um, and it's 300,000 units. So this is your opening work, right? And then at the end, remember I did tell you that sometimes the law might tell you to go to the that you can see what they do. On the uh, 80 June 2013, it's 90% completed. And the units that you see is 240,000. What was put into the production is 400,000 units. And what was completed in June is 420,000. 420,000. Oh, that's your information regarding units and also the percentage of complete. Additional information that they give you, provide you here, is saying that the materials added at the beginning are converted to the process standard. Normal losses are estimated as 4% of those that reach the wastage point. So, this is the size of your normal loss. Normal loss is estimated to be 4%. The units that reach that wastage point. First information for June is as follows they give you material and conversion, work and process, uh, process 1st of June. They give you the material to be 1 million 50. Current production material is 1.4, conversion is 402, and current production. They ask you to please prepare the weight, weighted prepare the weighted average quantity statement for June and assume that wastage point is when the process is 10% complete. Right. So that's where any unit that has reached it was before 10% complete, uh, I mean 10% wastage point experience this normal loss. Right, you just have to know how to treat it. Deduct all those. Then B asks you to prepare the first and first out method quantity statement and assume that wastage takes place at the end of the process. So when it's hundred percent at the end. Okay. Cool. So you have a task to do weighted average method. 10% wastage point. Other one, first and first out, wastage point is at the end. So let's look at the solution. Let's look at the weighted average solution first. All right. So here it is, wastage point is So we took the input. Why did you start with? So the input. Hello? Is somebody speaking? Okay, I'll just continue. Our opening work is 300,000 and what is putting to production is 400,000. So you are starting off with units of 700,000. Very clear on that one, right? And Remember, we did say that under weighted average, you don't split your completed and transferred. Um, you just write it as this. So it's 420,000. Go here. So under weighted average, you have your completed and transferred to be 420,000. Right? And if it's completed and transferred, that means that your raw material unit is at 100%. And conversions is at 100 percent, right? And you see it's a principal mark. So they give you that principal mark 
for noting that if it's completed and transferred, everything is at a hundred percent. Cool. Normal laws, on the other hand, this is how they've calculated it. Let's look. Um, so the wastage point is ten percent. Let's now think about it. For opening web, what is that number one rule? It says that if your uh, opening web was before the wastage point, it means that you keep it, right? And then if it is after, meaning it came after the wastage point, you deduct it. So the opening web was 20% complete. This means that it was after the wastage point. So as a result, you deduct it. You don't keep it. Am I correct? Right? So you deduct it from the input because it, 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 it already experienced this loss probably in the previous process. It doesn't have to experience it again in this cycle. Then, with the closing web, where was it? Closing web was also after, so you keep it. It was after the wastage point, you keep it according to the law. So that means that you don't deduct it from the 700,000. So as a result, it's 700,000, which is this input, minus the 200, I mean, the 300,000 of your opening web. Then you show the size, which is 4%. And your normal loss is 16,000. Look, guys, they give you a principal mark for noting where your normal loss should be. You get a mark and you get a 100% raw material and also just showcasing 10% as to where the wastage point was. You get principal marks for that. You, find, you get a full mark for getting the number right, but then... The others you get principal mark for it. Okay. Our closing unit was 240. That one you put it as it is, 240. And the balancing figure will be your abnormal loss. The balance figure is your abnormal loss. You get a principal mark for noting that you have a balancing figure and it is your abnormal loss. And in this instance, we assume that it happened also at 10% at each point. All right. And then, uh, uh, okay, cool. Then you also indicate that um, your closing whip is at 90%. Yeah. Because they told us 90% complete. Any questions related to this portion of weighted average? Do you guys have any questions? Is there anything that you'd like to understand? Or was it all right compared to your attempt? I'd like to get some feedback. Mine was okay. I did get it right. Well done. And others? Actually, mine was off. Mine was what off. Uh, what made it off was that uh, was the was the normal loss, the normal loss calculation because of the what do you call it? Um, mine was off because of the. I, I'm struggling to calculate the the wastage point, the waste point. That's what even from the example I tried to do it because on Wednesday I had a lot of load shading. Okay. But my but my what you call this. Um, yeah, the wastage point part, I'm really struggling to. You can please just do one more time there. Sorry, class, for, 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 for this one. No worries. So if I may ask, what did you do with your normal loss so that I get a better understanding as to where the issue might be? How did you calculate your normal loss? So, so how I... So I calculated my, my, my normal loss. Is, I, I'm just sorry. I'm just trying, struggling to understand the wastage point. How do I get to my wastage point? Okay. Yeah. All right. Because so, I got stuck mm. there and, you know, and then everything else just went left. But then that was the root problem. Mm. 
Okay, cool. So maybe this that this is Teams. So Teams doesn't give you tools of um okay, Refilue, you can go. No worries. It's just the Teams doesn't allow you to write, um, just to display. If it was Zoom, it would be a different scenario. Let me go to the module. All right, cool. So let's go to E. Or A, fine. Let's use this one. I don't want where you go deduct. So there's rules, right? Uh, that govern, yeah, it's similar to this. So there's rules that govern your normal loss treatment, right? So how we understand it is that in this instance, there's a process, 0% and 100%. I hope you're following. They tell you where your wastage point occurs, right, during this process. The wastage point can happen at the beginning or at the end or during the process. Wastage point, like we've mentioned, that's where you start experiencing loss. So they will tell you where. So the where part, wastage point, yeah, it was 30%. So once the process is 30% in, by 30%, you start experiencing normal loss. Normal loss, okay. Yeah. That's number one. So you have to draw it for yourself as to where is this wastage point? Is 30%? And we will also look at the exam. Is 30%? Then thereafter, you start asking yourself these questions. All right. So I've discovered where my wastage point is. Is 30%. What's the number of units that I start with? So you'll find that here is your opening whip and what was put into production. So it's 290. I started with it here at zero. Then they tell you your opening whip is 40% into the process. So you plot it down here. They tell you closing whip is 30% into the process. So you plot it where it is. So it's here, 30% here. Then you start Sorry. asking your question. Opening whip, was it before? the wastage point or was it after the wastage point? In this instance, it's after because it's 40% in. So as a result, you have to deduct it from your input, what you started with. Why? Because it already experienced normal loss in its previous process. And if it was before, this wastage when that means it was going to experience the normal loss, therefore you would have kept it under this input. So it's all about asking yourself at what point when it comes to opening with at what point was this uh was this a uh, wastage point where the normal loss occurs? And you ask yourself, opening with was it before or after? If it was before, it would make sense for you to keep it so that we experience this normal loss. If it was after, you have to deduct it from what you started with so that it doesn't experience the normal loss twice. So you deduct it. Now, I continue. Yes. Closing with, was it before the wastage point or was it after? It was before. I mean, it's 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 equivalent, right? Was it before? It's 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 it, it it starts being in it at eighty percent. So you keep it. You don't deduct it. You keep it. Therefore, as a result, you say, what are the units, the total units that are going to experience this loss? So I started with two ninety. I'm taking out the opening whip. I'm keeping the closing whip. Then I'm remaining with. 200,000. After you have defined the number of units that will experience this loss, you ask yourself, how much of these units am I going to lose? How much? I'm, I'm going to that. lose 10%. That's the 200. So back to the exam question. They asked you, 
they they you started the process just that I can't draw but just visualize. Where is it? Maybe I can. Uh, I can edit. I don't want to sign. Can I highlight? I highlighting doesn't work. So I can't write. Ne? I'm sorry. I thought there's a pointer that I can use to draw. But anyway, you get the gist of it. So just imagine it's 0% here and it's 100 here. Cool? So first thing first, they told you under this quantity statement that you are doing, your wastage point is at 10%. So it's 0, then wastage point is 10% here. Right, it's ten percent. You have to put it wastage point. So any unit that reaches this ten percent will experience normal loss, a normal loss of four percent. But in a ten percent, my opening whip comes in after at twenty percent. Then my closing is at a ninety percent, right? And then here would be your hundred percent. So question starts. How many units did you start this process with? You started with the 300,000 plus the 400, which is 700,000 units, which you have here, right? I started with the 700. Then you start same question again. Opening with, was it before? Was it before the wastage point or was it after? In this instance, when was it? Was it before or after? When my wastage point is 10%, was the was my opening whip before or after? It was after. It was after. Yeah. So meaning it won't be subject to this loss. So what do you do? Do you keep or do you deduct? You deduct. You deduct, right? Mm. So mm. you will deduct because it's after. Cool. Then you come to your closing whip. Was it before or was it after? It was after. So you keep. You don't deduct it. So as a result, you have 700 minus the one that you said you're going to deduct. Then units that will be subject to your loss is 400,000. Then you ask yourself, how much of these units am I going to lose? It's 4% because they told you that it's estimated to be 4%. Then it's your 400 multiplied by 4%. Then your normal loss is 16,000 and you put it here under your output column. Aye, 10 out of 10. Okay, sharp, sharp, sharp. Okay, sharp. Thank you. So just know those rules and then be able to apply them. And this was underweighted. We'll see how normal loss is treated under first and first out. Cool. Abnormal loss, it's your balancing figure. Okay. Right. So let's go to the first in, first out portion. So the first in, first out, they told you that your wastage point is at the very end. It's at when the stage is 100%. So let's see how they treated this one. And remember also your quantity statement under first in, first out, you need to split your completed uh, units. So let's start. How many units did you start with? So the opening whip is 300,000. Put into production, it's 400. So you are starting off with 700,000 units. Then your details, they start. Put into production, I mean, sorry, completed. You say, what was completed from my opening whip? Number one, you can't put 300,000. Why? We now need to start that whole thing of normal loss. Because remember, under first in, first out, your opening inventory is affected by your normal loss. Right? So we say that it's 300 multiplied by 96%. That means that you took out that 4%. Do you guys understand why it's 288 and not 200? Because back to that question again, did, did um, opening whip, was it before or after the wastage point? In this instance, it was before the wastage point, right? Because wastage point was at the end 
and this opening inventory came in at 20%. So it was before the wastage point. So as a result, that means that it will experience will experience on this opening inventory. Then as a result, it's 300 multiplied by the 96%. 96% takes out this 4%, guys. If you were someone else, you'd say 300 multiplied by 4%. That's your normal loss. Then you say 300 minus the answer that you got. You will then arrive to 288,000. So under first in, first out, your opening inventory, you have to ask yourself, did it experience loss in the cycle or in the previous one? If you experience cycle in this current period, you have to showcase it here. All right? Do you guys understand? I actually don't understand why we're doing the 96%. Can you just repeat that again? There's a rule here that speaks about how to treat your normal laws when you have a first in, first out. So, under first in first out here's the rule they tell you if your opening whip is before the wastage point smaller than means before smaller than means before so if your opening whip percentage is before the wastage point you need to reduce your opening inventory by the normal loss on this unit do you guys understand that part? So in this instance, in this question, our wastage point for under the first and first out, it's a hundred percent, right? It's at a hundred percent. When units reach hundred percent, they start experiencing loss, right? So can someone please uh, mute yourself? So someone can you please mute yourself thank you so what are we saying now we're saying it's at a hundred percent any units that re reach hundred percent start experiencing this loss so you look at your opening inventory in this instance it was 20 percent complete so question comes was it before or after this wastage point I'm asking you guys. It was before. It was before. So as a result, that means that it will experience this loss in this current period, right? So under first in, first out, they tell you that the opening inventory units that you have, meaning this 300 units, needs to be reduced by your normal loss. So let's calculate that calculate here it is so that means that it's 300,000 multiply by 4% 0 0.04 right so it's 12,000 that's the normal loss so this rule tells you that this 300,000 needs to be reduced by the 12,000 minus the normal loss because it experienced loss, so you have to show it. Then your answer is 288, which is this. So, my question is how has it experienced a loss when we haven't reached 100%? Remember, so we said that, yes, we, we have to say it will reach 100%. It's the same rule. If it was 60%, and this mm -hmm. it's that whole point of saying, when is the wastage point? Remember, this is output. It's not input, it's output. So we're saying at the very end, would my opening win inventory have would it have would it have experienced normal loss or not? It would have. Because it's at the end. Okay, I get you. Whether this was gonna be 80% or whatever, but we're saying at the end of this process. Would it have experienced this normal loss, yes or no? And we're saying yes. So as a result, it's 288. Awesome. Understood. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? 
I got it right, but the only challenge I had, I used 10 percent uh, on oh, um, the 10, 10 percent. Yes. And then yeah, 10 percent, I, I used the <laughs> actually I didn't check the last word where oh, it says yes, it, uh, it wastage point was at the end. So I mm, used the 10 percent. Um, that's where I've lost it. Mm, and then mm. now at the end of the day, it ruined everything because and then but the other thing. On on the opening inventory, I said 300 my, uh, times 100 percent minus 10 percent. 10 percent is the one that I, that we used on on A. So mm. uh, yeah, that's the, that's, that's that, but that actually end. still, but still because of I was supposed to use four percent of normal, normal loss, not yes, because I, I, I understand why I got yeah. it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I with the and the other thing that I got wrong is the conversion, conversion cost of, of under normal loss and abnormal loss. I've, I've used 10% as well. So, but the mm. the raw materials, I got them right. But when it comes to uh, conversion, I use 10%. That's when now oh. the value, it goes down and then it is different from the yeah. uh, Yes, but I, I get it. Why, why, why I, I get got it. wrong? Yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you, you thought you continued with the wastage point of ten percent as opposed to reading the question saying that it's at the end. Yes, I, I didn't get the. Actually, I, I failed to to read it uh, where yes. it says the at the end of the process. That's where the problem started, I guess. Okay, cool. I'm glad that you can see, but it's a it's a small. You get the you you get the gist of things. It's just that now it was just um, the percentage that you got wrong. That's it. But you get the gist yes. of things. Yes. yes. So it's just a matter of making sure that you read questions. So that means that you are on the right track. You just have to make sure that when you do questions, you read the question because A and B doesn't mean that it will stay the same. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Then, um, all right, so under first in first out, we know that com uh, your current production, it's a balancing figure. You know that, right? Uh, when you split it, because you would have, you, you, you have your completed and transferred, you have your opening inventory, therefore your current production will be your balancing figure. Then we go back again in terms of, this um, the normal loss. In this instance, they deducted the yes. Let's let's start it again in terms of calculating the normal loss. Again, normal loss. You start with that uh, diagram to say, all right. So the process zero percent. It ends at a hundred. Where's my wastage point? Is at the very end, which is a hundred percent. You start again, opening inventory. Was it before or after the wastage point? It was before. So as a result, it will be subject to the loss. We saw it. So you keep it in terms of your input. Then you go to your closing whip. Was it before or was it after? It was before. And as a result, you deduct it from your input. Those are the two rules. So now you deduct it from your input. So as a result, what is my normal loss? It's the 460 multiplied by 4% and that's your normal loss there. And yet again, normal loss in this instance is a balancing figure. Okay, so am I correct in saying, if, I, if I'm understanding it this way, in terms of why we deduct that uh, closing inventory, am I correct in saying, the closing inventory will only experience the wasted point, let's say in the next fiscal or in the next month because um, we closed, but then that portion of the inventory had not passed the wasted point. That's why we deducted. Am I correct in thinking that way? I think that's that's a fair one as to how to understand it, hey? Okay? Yeah, cool. yeah, instead of cramming it. All right. But just make sense out of it. Yeah. All right. So that was the homework. But just please note, principle 
marks. You see how many principal marks are there? The only two things where it was a full mark that you needed to get correct. It was the opening inventory portion and the not. But understanding that current production needs to be a balancing figure, you get a principal mark. Understanding that your opening work needs to be a balancing figure, you get a principal mark. Understanding that conversion cost would be at 100% because of that normal loss portion, it's a principal mark. Also an abnormal loss. Also knowing that your raw material would be at 100%. Principal mark. And also knowing that your opening inventory in this instance, it would be at 0%. It's a principal mark. Also you completed that at the end, it would be at a hundred percent. It's a principal mark. So let's look at how many principal marks are here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's quite a lot, no? It's principal marks, but it's just understanding the gist of things that what needs to be where, how it's a balancing figure. So this just gives you more encouragement to make sure that you finish your questions. Just do your questions and make sure you finish your questions and stick to the time. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Um, I need help with this uh, conversion cost. I don't understand how did we get 80% for that uh, opening inventory? Yes. Yes. Remember, your opening inventory was 20% complete. Under first in first out method, we say, I mean, under equivalent unit, we ask you how much does this opening inventory needs to be completed in this current process? It's 80. Because it started coming in at a 20, but we're saying for it to be completed, it's 100 minus the 20, and it's the 80%. How much of it still needs to be worked on? Am I making sense? Yes, ma'am. So we always uh, minus uh, from 100% in FIFO method. Yes, um, I think also in, yeah, it's, it's in first in first out, no? I was going to yes. be corrected. Yeah, it's in first in first out because under uh, weighted average, we don't even show the split of opening inventory. So it's in under first in first out, yes, correct. Okay, okay thank you, ma'am. Pleasure. So I'd say that given what we went through, I'll try to give you guys another um, uh, homework around process costing. So just so that it sticks to, you know, the more you practice, it's the more you become familiar with it, right? So I'll try see if we can also do a nice question and then we can mark it during the week again. And then I know that by the time that you are done with a different question for process costing, you are good to go now. But I'm glad that you guys are tempted. I'm glad that you guys can even see uh, where maybe you went a bit wrong. Some others is just reading this, but then the principles are there. So I can see that they're understanding, they're grasping the principles. So I'm, I'm really, really proud of that. So I'm, I'm happy from my side when it comes to that. Okay. Sorry, please, can I request that you share the um, exam pack that I saw you had open just now? Yeah, um, I think I've already shared it, hey? but I'll share it please again. Share it again, because, yeah, we only, some of us only joined the group recently. Okay, cool. So I will send it, and then I will also give you guys uh, another homework for process costing, because we covered it over, I think, two classes so far. So. I'll just give you a gate so that you can make sure you bet down those principles. Then we'll mark it during the week. Then we should be fine. Then uh, it doesn't mean that I won't give you a standard costing one. It's coming also after this um, session today. So you'll have two homeworks. Okay. All right. So that was process costing. Like I said, I'm, I'm happy to see the progress. So well done. Uh, those who still want to go through the theory, more than welcome. Just make sure that you are comfortable. And I think the pack that I will give you, please practice the questions that I give you under time pressure. Because if you understand the, 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 the knowledge, now you have to get the exam technique. 
which will make a difference between a pass and an average number, uh, and uh, an average mark. So now you need to practice under exam technique. So, that, I mean, uh, exam pressure. So by the time you write the exam, you are used to writing quickly and thinking on your feet, which is a different ball game, right? So I'll give it to you and then also homework. Right. Done with process costing. Now we're going to talk about budgeting and then introduce standard costing. Okay. I'm using the old uh, study unit because that's what I have. But you guys also gave me your you gave me your I'll also give you guys a screenshot of the solution. I'll give you guys that. Um, I just want to make sure that I've covered everything. You gave me your unit. Um, yeah, there's a question for standard cost. Um, you gave me your study unit, but I didn't see budgeting. But we're just going to be high, like high level, talk about what budgeting is. You will be doing most of the talking just to get an understanding of what budgeting is. And then I'll try use for standard costing your module that you gave me. Mm. I think it's this one. Yes. Cool. I have shared the practice questions ne, on the WhatsApp. Thank you. You're the best. Thanks. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, so you'll use that pack. That pack helps not to say that's what was going to come out, but it just helps you with uh, various topics, questions, just additional questions. Right. So why do you think Let's start with discussing, as I've said, budgeting process is more of a discussion, and then we'll start going through the field of standard costing. Why do you think it's important for companies to do a budget? Or before we say why, what is budgeting? What do you guys understand? If somebody says you must make a budget, even if it's personal, it doesn't have to be a company, why, uh, what is budgeting? Someone or your niece or your children asks you what budgeting is, what would you say it is and why is it important? Now, do you guys budget or you don't? Or what do you guys think is budgeting and why is it important? Okay, so for me, I'd say budgeting is focusing what you will spend and what income you'll get. Um, yeah, it's just that future focus of I mean, a focus of what you're going to spend and what income you're going to receive. So in companies, usually budget, um, you obviously present what income you focusing for the following fiscal year, and then focus also your expenses based on probably previous expenses and income that you've received and what you focus for your sales for the next fiscal. Okay, nice. And why do you think we do that? Anyone can answer, by the way. Uh, because we need to have a target. We, if you know your target, is is easier to push for, like to to remain in the, like in case you say your budget is ten thousand, because of you know that um, last year you managed to do nine thousand. So at least you edit a little bit because of every year the the interest rates they do increase obviously you cannot stay on the same amount that you did last year you need to increase it a little bit and then everyone knows uh they need to work around which amount okay okay cool so yeah it, it helps you to budgeting helps you to if you're looking at the cost to control your cost right because you wouldn't want to overspend. So let's say on a monthly, you get paid, it's either it's an allowance or you get um, your salary comes in. You start already budgeting as to making an estimate of how much are you going to spend this month compared to the income that you got, which is your salary, right? Then you start looking as to, okay, fine, I'll have my 
mortgage or rent that I need to pay, there's food, there's insurances, there's debit orders for the clothes accounts that I have. You start drafting a budget as to does my income actually cover my costs, my spending, my living expenses, right? And it is your responsibility, no one else but yours, to say that at the end of this month, uh, I need to have spent so, so much on food. It's just, just that now you also have to forecast to say, Yo, right now petrol is up, fish oil, not cooking oil, fish oil. cooking oil is up, um, certain foods that you used to eat are up. You now start looking, all right, where do they normally have specials for food? Because you need to control your budget, especially in instances where uh, salary hasn't increased over some time, right? You still need to try to see, all right, that means that now I need to buy either in bulk or I need to get into a stock fell for food. I'm making an example with your own personal life because I find that management accounting also gives you principles, life life principles that you need to um, apply in your life, right? So you start looking, do I need to, what is it that I need to do to control my spending? Because you don't want to get to a situation by the end of the month, you don't even get to that week of the month. You can't even go to work, you can't electricity, you can't, you can't, there's so many things that you now uh, can't do because you've overspent. It's that decision of, do you want to buy, can I afford to buy this uh, nice bag of shoes that I saw, or can I save up a bit before I start spending on what I want? Or can I splurge? If I splurge, would I be able to cover myself to get to month end when I'll get my salary again? So that's budgeting in your life. Same thing even with companies. Companies, as you guys said, they need to forecast to say that with the products that we are selling now, are they still in demand? Do people still want it? Okay, fine. If that's the case, how much can we produce this year to make sure that we meet this demand of people? You start calculating, all right, fine. I think that we need to produce such in order to do it, in order to make a million of sales. All right, cool. So there's the sales portion. Then thereafter, they look at their cost. How much will it cost us to produce this 100,000 units? Material, it will be this much. People, how many people do we think we're going to need to produce this 100,000 units? You mentioned these people, I'll pay them this much for this amount of hours. Even the hours, you get to the detail of what will make you have a profitable year. Then it happens that now there's a set target, as you guys said, that you guys are pushing. But life happens, right? I'm going to make an example of... Um, yeah, and then they say that the budget that you make, any single goal that you have, needs to follow the SMART principle. It needs to be sustainable, measurable, attainable, result, and time bound. Because you have to say that when are you going to meet this target? Would it be this month, or is it the, the, the example that I was making of your salary? It's a short term one because it's on a monthly basis. But others need to do long term goals. What, time of, what type of long term goals do you have? It might be a thing of changing your job, saying I need more money or I need a promotion. So you start working towards that goal to increase your income, right? Then once you've increased your income, you say, do I still live within the uh, how I used to live when I was getting lesser? Or can I afford a bit more? But I don't want to get to a stage where I don't have money. So those questions are around being smart, right? Sustainable, measurable, attainable. Um, we've spoken about this. So it's a bit of theory. So 
you 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 budget to plan ahead you budget to coordinate because coordination is as i was saying with the raw material and stuff you need to be able to say all right um what's that what's that department the department that outsource um supply yeah people who deal with making orders for the raw materials you deal with them to say okay so on average how much do we actually produce how much do these suppliers charge us are they going to increase their cost for next year it's those things that get into budgeting and it's all about controlling. I said control management has to do most of the time with your cost, because it is your responsibility to set this target and make sure that you're within the budget. They always say make sure that you're within the budget. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go through this. So you go through the theory of saying it just shows different departments as to what do they help you with? What type of function do they play within your budget? So would you guys say that budget is fixed or is it flexible? Is budget fixed or is it flexible? It's replaceable. Pardon? I would say Hello? fixed, but obviously uh, sometimes it does change. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fixed, right? I'd say a budget is fixed. It's fixed. It's fixed. But there is a portion where now it needs to be flexible. So maybe let me, you guys will go through the theory of different types of budgeting. Eh? There's zero, there's cash, there's uh, even the ABC one. It's just different tools. Let's talk about flexible budgets. So a budget is fixed, right? To say this is the target for the year. We budget the year before. We look at inflation. We look at GDP. As I've said, you even look at your rent, where your property is, would it be? You, you, you take those macro factors into play and a bit of micro uh, factors, then you make a budget, then it's fixed. We're saying that next year our target is to make 1 million sales at a cost of 600,000, and we've got a profit of 400,000. It's fixed. but it does happen that life happens. So maybe maybe make an example. We did before 2020, where I work, we were doing prior to 2020, all those other years, we used to do a budget. We used to budget season was around September. We start looking at how we performed. We looked at previous years as to uh, what is the trend. You know, it used to be like an intense Places. We do our budget, we put we, then they tell us if they are happy or not, but that's the third budget. Then, even within our tools, the reporting tools, because I'm in finance, we will see the budgeted number. How far off are we? We'll even ask for commentary every single month to say, all right, this is how we perform this month, but this is the budget. Why are we behind budget or what's making us have budget, right? So it, was, it used to be that, right? Once the budget is set, it's set, we don't change it. However, COVID happened. It hit us, right? And that was in 2020. What happened? An instruction was now made we need to do a forecast. And this forecast needs to be done on a, quart a quarterly basis. So every three months, we forecast giving into account the actual. So we'll have a set target in terms of, it might be the rates, it might be, uh, uh, yeah, it's rates or, or, let me just use rates. We'll have set standard rates, but now we need to take into account our actuals. So that's a flexible budget because you are forecasting giving into account what actually happened. You guys understand? So now, right now, since COVID, we saw that there's certain things that you might not be able to, to predict if that they will happen. COVID 
happened and everything and you were there's no transacting happy people inside their home. We would it's it's almost like budgeting but now it's on quarter we need to it's gonna happen. We have to have a flexible budget. And this comes into play with standard courses. So I'll just read here as to what is flexible budget, and then we'll look at an example. But just bear in mind that budget, when you flex your budget, you are taking into account your actual volume. What actually happened now against your standard rate or standard payout rate or those rates, flex it to just have a forecasted amount. So what is a flexible budget? Um, is one that restates the position if a variation from expected sales and production volume occurs. In other words, it's a budget that calculates your budgeted income and cost according to the actual volume. What actually happened? So you take into account what actually happened and you forecast from it. As opposed to the, the fixed budget, it was a, a year before. We use trends, we use previous information in order to make that budget. Now, a flexible budget, I'm still forecasting my income and cost, but I'm taking the actual production into play. Does it make sense? Any questions on what a flexible budget is? Um, do you mean in this case you take into account factors such as um, inflation, interest rates and stuff, and then you work from there? So what I mean is that you take into account what you actually produce, what actually happens now. So I'll make an example. I'm sorry, I'm using the banking uh, industry. You guys know that in Jan this year, the repo rate changed, right? South African Reserve Bank came and said that, all right, repo rate used to be this much. We are now changing it and increasing it by 25 basis points. What does that mean? That means that for the um, a per person who bought a house, if their installment used to be 5,000, they are now increasing it to be, let's say, 5,500. We have to take that into account because if I use the budgeted uh, fixed uh, rate, it wouldn't take into account this change, this rate. They changed it again in March. So that means that when I'm forecasting my income, I need to take into account what actually happened now. In March, they changed it again and they increased it by 25 bits. So as a result, whoever has a home loan, a car, a credit card, any product where we are lending money, their installment increased. As a result, that means that for the bank, the income increases. I need to take that into account. So I'm making an example of a bank where an actual information affects our forecast. Right. So another example would be we can use this example of an actual production uh, affecting your budget. So Pumi drafted the following budget for Supreme Pi. She based the calculation on an activity level of 5,000 units. Right. So Pumi. These are the sales using this 5,000 units. 20 rand, 4 rand, 20 rand. I'm just giving you the rates. 10 rand and, and 2 rand 50. Those are the variable costs. Then they give you six. And then they give you budgeted um, net profit of 15,000. However, the following were the actual results. So this was a budgeted profit, 15,000. It's fixed. Took into account inflation, took into account GDP, 
all those macro level factors yeah uh, what was happening in the economy at that time so let's say it was a year before so now actual results come into play for supreme they now manufactured and sold 6,000 units. These are the actual production volume, as opposed to that 5,000 that she based the budget on. So how much did they actually end up making? It's now budgeted profit of 36,000 as opposed to the 15. Because the 6,000, there was an additional 1,000 sales that came from an order that they secured from a government department. They couldn't have forecasted for that, right? Because they didn't know at the time. So we have to do a difference between a flex and a fixed. So Pumi is very satisfied with the company's performance. Um, she wants to pay her staff a bonus of 5% because she's excited, right? It's to, they made almost double what she budgeted for. So she wants to base their 5% bonus on the difference between their and the difference is a million. I mean, the, the bonus will now uh, be this amount to not a million, sorry, a thousand, right? So now we have have to they ask draw at your actual and your flex budget based on the 6,000 units. Let's go. I hope you guys are still following. Very important that it, and it, it blends in nicely with standard core. So the actual result is based on a 6,000 units. Your flex budget, I said it has to take into account what happened in this year. So it's the 6,000, right? And your budget was based on 5,000. So there's no difference between actual and flex budget volumes because it's based on actual volumes. But your fixed budget was based on what you targeted your volume to be. So you will see that 1,000 difference. So now, how does a flex budget work? A flex budget, you are using the rates, your budgeted rates, but you apply them on what actually happened. Does it make sense? What a flex budget is. You're using your standard rate, but you apply them on what actually happened, which is the units in this instance. So difference between sales is that under actual sales, we made 135. But under flex budget, we would have forecasted 120. The difference is 5,000, I mean 15,000. But under fixed budget, our difference was going to be 20,000. So you see that the difference between your actual and flex, it's, it's not that big. Whereas when you see with the fixed budget, it's a huge difference. That means that if Pumi makes her makes her um, uh, sorry sorry I just want to check this. There are bonuses on. There's a huge difference between uh, the bonus that they will make on on your, what I'm saying is that, remember initially, she said that she wants to base her budget, I mean, her bonus, the 5% on the different uh, budget, actual. But in actual fact, it will make sense for them to make it against the flex budget and the actual. Am I making sense? Because at least the flex budget, it's a, a more realistic budget as opposed to the fixed one. Um, do you guys have any questions around that? Do you, are you guys with me? 
I, to here. be honest, I'm lost. <laughs> I like I hear you, but I can't hear you. So I think maybe I'll have to listen to the recording again. Okay, but but so what I'm saying is that there's a fixed budget, there's a flex budget, and there's what actually happened. A fixed budget doesn't sure. take into once you've locked it. You would have done it, let's say, a year before. You lock it. You don't change it. It's fixed, right? Then there's a flex budget. A flex budget takes into account what actually happened, which is a more realistic budget, a, a more realistic forecasting, if you get what I mean. Because you still have your standard rate, your targeted rate, but you apply it against the actual volumes. For instance, the actual volumes in this scenario that we are looking at took into account a government tender that these people won, which brought them additional thousand units that they sold. So it doesn't take that thousand extra. It's locked. But a flex budget takes into account the production, what happened actually this year in terms of volumes. But we still use the standard or target rates. And it's easier to ask your managers to say, why is it that my sales, uh, sorry, why is it that we, for instance, let's look at the cost, why is it that we spend more, I mean, we spend less on material as opposed to what we forecasted. Am I making sense? Yeah, why I get it. We spend, why is it that we, you can drive the conversation because it's flexed. It is taking into account what actually happened this year. So when you have the conversation of saying, how come we spend less than what we anticipated for our material, you can always speak to saying that, oh, we got a bulk discount, or, oh, we're actually using more experienced, um, skilled workers, so they were able to save or uh, save the material that they were using, or they were not wasting their material. You can have that discussion, because guess what? We are basing our volume on like for like. It's not that distant from uh, a budget because a budget, there's a huge difference in our discussion. Example, in this instance, remember this one is a, it's a flex budget, it's 36,000. Look under a budget. A budget, they said that uh, you're going to spend 30,000 on material. You ended up spending 32. Do you see how the conversation is now different? Because I'll be like, why did you overspend? Right? But under a flex budget, I'm saying, how come you didn't overspend? How come you saved us 3,240? Do you see how a flex budget, it's more a realistic budget because it's taking into account what happened this year. Whereas yeah, a fixed uh, budget, yeah, it's yeah. fully removed from what happened this year. And the example is this one of saying, you overspend. But when I looked under flex, you actually saved us 3.2. So this gives into play the conversation of standard costing. Standard costing plays around um, flex budgeting. We're taking into account the actual production, what actually happened. But we're still using our target rate, our target uh, rate, I mean, uh, your cost per unit for your material, your cost per, per unit for your labor. We stick, we're still taking those targeted rates. But we now look at your actual, what actually happened to drive the necessary discussions so that we are not so removed from what happened. Example this, so that management can give you 
insight into your con into your cost. They can give you insight into your sales. As opposed to saying, we're always going to mention, ah, there was inflation, minister said this, you know, macro, like high level reasons. Direct costing helps you to drill down into what actually happened. Why are we so far away from our targets or why are we exceeding our targets? It drives those conversations as to fix budget which does drive conversation, but you're saying that they are very high level. Are, are we together? Yeah, I, I get it. Because oh, what you're saying is the fixed budget and the flex budget, they use the same rate and then by the different units because of the flex budget, they use the actual units. Is, is so, what you're saying. Yeah. The rate for flex budget and the fixed budget is the, is the same rate. But yes. because of the flex budget, they try to make sure that we are on the right track. They use the actual units. Yes, we, we're taking into account what actually happened. And as a result, you try to uh, have that, those necessary discussion as to why are the rates different? Why is it that your quantity it's a bit different because there's standard quantity, but we'll look at it now. But under flex budget, it's those discussions of looking at the suppliers that you guys use. In terms of buying your material, did you buy bulk or were you buying each one of them? Were you now changing the quant I mean the 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 the, the supplier because now you want quality material as opposed to what you are used to. So so now we are having those discussions of labor. Are you using skilled labor now? Because of this order that you had, did you now see that actually I need skilled labor? Because you see here, you overspend. You overspend. Why is that? We said, we thought that you used 20 rand per hour, but now it's 22 rand fifty per hour. Why? You start looking at those things of saying, I. The manager can say, we made a decision that given this order, we need skilled labor. They come in at a higher rate. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I understand now. So now the questions, the, the discussions are now different. And as you can see under your material, I think I'll cover it at when we're doing standard costing, just to see how they flex. This is how you flex your, this is, because uh, you see, okay, let me maybe try it. If you don't understand it, you'll understand as you go. Um, what they actually produced, I mean, actually sold and produced the 6,000 units, right? Look at the material. So the material that we have, under actual, they used 8,400 kilograms, right? So you would need to, calculate the kilograms that they would have used given the whole thing of budget. So you would have to say 7,500 kilograms was what we used for budget, right? But you're trying to quantify as to how much would it have been if it was for 6,000 volumes, I mean 6,000 units. So you'd say your 7.5 kilograms divided by 5,000, which is this, because these two were for budget, but you multiply it by the 6,000 units, because you are trying to get it to give you uh, the number of kilograms that you would need to use for the 6,000 units. Am I making sense? Still at a four rand per kg, the one for budget, but you are trying to get the number of hours or the number of kilograms specifically for this 6,000 volume. Are, are you guys with me as to why they calculating it this way? We are trying to find the hours that we would need to work in order to produce the 6,000. Uh, we are here. Yeah, but do you understand what, what's happening here? 
I think I understand. Yeah, okay. All right. So that flex budget drives the discussion. It helps you that even when you give people your bonuses, you don't overpay them. All right. You can at least attach the performance to what actually happened. You can find, you can have those constructive discussions between you and your managers before you give them the bonuses. A flex budget gives you a realistic forecasting as opposed to a fixed one, which is still important, but we're just saying that a fixed budget, it's sometimes a bit remote from what actually happened. It creates a huge gap between what actually happened and what was budgeted. You will read the advantages and disadvantages of having a budget and um, also just try do your um, just two examples to uh, get an understanding of a flexed and fixed. Another good example of a, a flex budget is guess which one is it? It's applied overheads. Remember applied overheads, you use your budgeted rate, but you apply it against what actually happened. You guys see, then you ask yourself, did we over or under recover? Because with applied overheads, you make an estimate of what your overheads would be given the actual production. Then by the time that you spend, you, you, you actually get your actual fixed overheads you make a comparison of saying, did we overestimate or did we underestimate? Applied overheads is actually a good example of a fixed budget. You guys remember the applied overheads, right? Yes. That's actually flex budget. That's you flexing your budget because you are using your budgeted rate, your estimated rate, multiply by what actually happened. Then you always compare it to your actual spent and then see, did you overestimate or underestimate? So that's budgeting. What was very important about budgeting is understanding what a budget is, what are the, those um, advantages and disadvantages of budgeting, and also um, what a flex budget is. How do you use a flex budget and why is it important? What are those disadvantages and advantages of a flex budget? All right. And as a result, you then can get into standard costing because a flex budget gives you a nice footing into standard costing. Because standard costing, honestly, it's more of us getting those discussions that I've said as to why did you overspend? Why did you underspend? Because it's also a good thing to know why did you underspend, right? So that you can control your cost. All right. Um, I hope we are still together. I haven't lost you guys. With It was a bit of theory, but and also different from process costing. But it's very important that you understand the basis of why do we budget, because then it, it gives you a nice footing, a nice introduction as to what standard costing is all about. Okay. So now I'm getting into standard costing. Okay, I'm going to try to use your module. This is the brand new module that you guys gave me and it will help us to illustrate a few things under standard costing and also give us the formulas that will help you do your very your variance analysis right because standard costing helps you have those discussions that i've mentioned as to uh, getting into the root of your variances between what you targeted versus what actually happened so there will be formulas that we look at and also what's very important around standard costing, it's the discussion points. Because it's all fun and well for you to be able to calculate 
using the formulas, can always understand the formulas. But what does it mean? What does that variance, the favorable variance mean? What does that unfavorable variance mean? And those are the qualitative factors. So standard costing, there's the quantitative factors. That's where you calculate and give us, I mean, the, yeah, the quantitative can quantify the variance between what actually happened and what you targeted. Then there's the qualitative factors as to why are we seeing the positive movement and the negative movement. You need to be able to do both for you to score your points under standard costing. All right, so in terms of direct material standards, so now we're just getting into the standard itself. So for you to set standards for your direct material, you need to look at the quantity of the input that you used, the quantity, meaning the number of kilograms, those kilograms, those meters for your direct material, we look at quantity and we look at quality. How much material did you use? And that informs the quality of the material. So I'll make an example. When you are buying a shirt, when you buy a shirt for a certain store that is low and cheap, Sometimes the quality, what happens, quantity you can buy where they say buy five for a hundred rand. You are there buying all those shirts. When you wash them or when you overuse them, what happens with the quality? You find that sometimes. The quality could be low. Yeah, it could be because you find that the more you use those shirts, the more it will end up tearing or it forms certain weird marks when you are washing it with your other clothes you find that the dye of that the color the color of those shirts they end up messing up with other colors quality right but quantity wise you bought five then you find that there's other stores where that hundred rand you buy only one shirt right I'm just saying in instances nowadays, everything is expensive and the quality sometimes is not, it doesn't go along with the price. But let's go back in the day when things were like that. So you find a shirt and it's a hundred grand, you, you can wear it as many times as you can. When you wash it, the color, the dye of the t-shirt doesn't ruin other clothes. It doesn't ruin itself. The color stays as it is. It doesn't get ruined doesn't come to a point where when we look at the t-shirt, is it really white or it's turning yellowish, you know? So same thing with direct material for a company. When you set the standard, you look at quantity of the inputs that you use, how, how much of that material did you use, and the quality of that material. Okay, so the information regarding the quality and quantity, you either get it from uh, those documents that are prepared when they were developing this product, or you observe the process. You interview your staff, right? Because when you're observing the process, you will see, remember with process costing, we were saying that when you start the process, I'm, I'm now introducing the normal laws and abnormal laws. When you're starting that, at that wastage point, where we're saying that here is where we're going to start losing our material. How much of it is it lost? Because I could imagine if 10% of the inputs of the material that you put in is now getting lost, you get a bit worried. 10% is a it's double digit, it's quite high. Well, as some quality, some products that you put in, I mean the material that you put into the process might be that your normal loss is actually 4%. It's actually not that bad. Right? So you observe the production process as to how much of this material is being used. And that's where you also see the quality before it ends up being a final product. There's quality inspections that happen when you do uh, a process where you, some people come and they check 
the quality of the material. They'll have certain devices where they measure and see the quality of the input. Okay. Um, so as I've mentioned, usually when the quality is high, your cost is high. This is one of the pointers that you need to write down and note because it will help you with your quality factors. Instances where your quantity is either high or the price is high. You can always say that the assumption is that the higher the quality, the higher the cost. This is very important that you note. Let me use orange sharp. But this is a qualitative factor. Okay. Then they say also that uh, in your book that the uh, so, so the quantity and the quality of the material are dependent on. Oh yes, you see, you have to make into account normal wastage. Remember, I told you about it for process costing. You have to take into account now as to the loss that you are making on this wastage point. Was it something that we could avoid? Or was it unavoidable? Do you guys understand? That's also another quanti qu qualitative factor of the movement variances. You'll see it, I'm building it up. By the time we do the questions, you will now see, oh, that's what she meant. But you have to take into account that the loss that we are making out of this material, was it normal or was it abnormal? Abnormal now, it might be that, as I've mentioned, material for someone to make that T-shirt, is the person who's using this material skilled or not? Because it might be all good and well that you are using quality material, but you find that you are using someone who's not experienced in sewing and making that T-shirt. As a result, what's going to happen? You're going to buy more material because this person keeps on wasting um, material because they don't know how to sew. So do, do you guys see? I'm just giving you those uh, factors. So another thing is that you need to identify your suitable suppliers for your material. Can they deliver within the time frame that they said they will at the price that you are paying? You now need to also look at your suppliers. So in terms of identifying the quantity that you're going to need and the cost, that's when you will be able to say, all right, cool. Now I have all the information as to the type of material that we're going to use, the quantity that we might be using. I've identified the supplier that I'm going to use. I've taken into account that there might be normal losses. Now, what is the standard given all these factors? That's when now you can determine the standard cost per unit for your material. But do you see that before you determine the standard cost, there's so many factors that you need to think of. And those are the factors that you will take into account when you're asking your manager as to why were we behind this standard cost? Or why were we above? Why did we overspend? Because you came up with this, all these factors that are relevant, that are very uh, taking into account the actual process that we go through, then you, that informed the standard cost that you came with. So why is it that we are varying against what the standard is? So do you guys understand as to when they say for your material, the standard cost is this much? This is what goes behind determining this amount. Are we all together? I don't want to lose you guys on this. I know it's a bit of theory, but just try to picture as to for them to say this is the standard cost, those are the factors that they look at that informs this amount. Okay. Same thing with direct labor. It's the same procedure. 
you look at the process. You identify inefficiencies. Workers comes with efficiencies or inefficiencies, meaning you start looking at the movements of your workers. Do they come in late? Do they know what they are doing? Do they idle a lot? You find that sometimes at offices, people are always taking small breaks instead of working. How much time do they actually take to work? How much time are they actually productive? Right? All those things that I just mentioned, uh, unnecessary movements of workers. Some people get to work immediately after they get to work at coffee time. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. <laughs> I'm just saying that they, you, you look at, you, you need to be realistic when you come to your standard rate, right? You look at how long do they do their coffee time? Okay, lunch. According to your context, how long did you say your lunch would be? Are they back in time? All right? When are they actually productive? Those are the questions that you ask yourself. Are they actually skilled? So after taking all of those into account, time and motion studies, then you can come up with the standard hours that it takes to make one unit. You can then say this is how much they can get, sorry, they can actually get paid given, um, given sometimes the rates must also take into account the government laws when it comes to payment. You need to look at the market rate as to a person who sold, uh, who make t-shirt, how much do they actually get paid? So the inefficiencies, they are more attached to hours worked, then you have to look at the rates. Are they paid well? Do our people actually even work overtime? What informs that? Then thereafter, you will come with the standard labor rate. This labor rate takes into account idle time because like, it's, it's very important for people to uh, still be able to move around work. They can't just come in and work, 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 and leave. They're going to take lunch. They're going to make coffee. Others will be taking smoke breaks. But is it normal? Is it not abnormal? We now people are forever now going to the shops once they arrive at their offices. Others nowadays, they spend time on take a lot, I'm making an example, online stores. Some people get to work and they are busy already online shopping. It's idle time, right? But how much of it is, is it reasonable? Does it make sense? So after looking at the process of your people, taking human behavior into account, then you can say, this is the standard labor rate. These are the standard hours. Because it's a realistic view as opposed to if it was budget, we'd be talking a different story. Because budget, you, you can't anticipate how long do these people idle, how long are they productive. It's very fixed, it's very high level. But now standard, on the other hand, it's more detailed. And yet again, what I've mentioned, these are the factors that you need to take into account whenever there's a variance. So do you see how detailed standard costing is? It makes you pinpoint exactly what the issue is. Why are you not meeting your target? Still together. I'll take that as a yes. Are uh, we still around? Do we okay. we here? Do we here? Yeah, okay, cool. But then, just looking okay. at the chart. <laughs> Location. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, developing overhead standards. These are predetermined recovery rates. Remember what I was saying, your applied overhead? 
this is where your standards are. So you would see in your applied overheads that they take into account normal capacity, right? So say normal production volumes. Uh, that would say that given the space of the factory, given the capacity of these machines, how much can we actually produce? That will help you and inform you in the rate that you use to determine your overhead. Because we look, when you buy a machine, it will tell you this machine can actually produce 10,000 t-shirts in a day. That's the capacity. That's its fullest potential. But we all know that sometimes a person who's using that machine doesn't know how to use it. They're not skilled enough, or there might be power cards that affect or interrupt the production of these t-shirts. That's what actually happens. But when you develop a standard, you're just saying that when I bought this machine for a million rand, I knew that it can give me 10,000 t-shirts in a day. So that's normal capacity. So those rates is what we use against what actually happened. And that's when the manager on the floor will start giving you stories as to why did we uh, underestimate or why did we overestimate. Okay. Those are the factors that you always have to think of when now we have to do various uh, variance analysis in terms of qualitative. But in terms of quantitative, we'll look at an example here. I think this one is just giving you a scorecard. Yeah, I mean, it's not yet the variances, but let's still look. I'll make an example of one. So, for example, a company product manufactures product triple X in two departments, assembly and finishing. To make one unit of product X, what does it take? It takes four kgs of component A and three hours of assembly, three hours of labor, and two kgs of component M, and four hours of fishing. No? Component A, this one, can be purchased at 120 rand per kg. And component M, your, it is 90 rand per kg. The assembly workers, their recovery labor rate is 110 per hour, while the fishing, finishing, why am I saying fishing? Finishing workers are 150 per hour. Your overheads using direct labor hours, so they tell you what is it that they use, and their rate is 50 rand per direct labor hours. Your fixed overhead rate, it is 80 rand per direct labor hours. That's the information that you're given. So in terms of a standard cost card, it will be as follows. You'll have your inputs and you say, what is my standard quantity? What is my standard price rate? Then what is the cost? Right? So there's two different things. So standard quantity, it's what they wrote there. It's four kgs for, for, for component A and the rate is 120. But the cost for assembly, it's when you say 4 kg multiplier 120 for 80. But just be aware that we've got standard cost, we've got standard rates. This is what we will use when you're doing your variance analysis. So there's always a standard cost card, card that splits your quantity, your price, and your cost. Okay. So if we look at it with what we've discussed, what would you say are the advantages and disadvantages of standard costing? After explaining how they get into that 
standard quantity and the standard price for direct labor or material or overhead. What would you say are the advantages of using standard cost? Um, uh, okay. uh, yeah. I so, advantage is wow. exactly what is needed. Pardon? You cut there, hey? Hello? Hello? Who was speaking? Okay, but what would you, what would you guys say are the advantages of using standard costing? Okay, so if I can try, I would say um, advantage would be, um, from what you've explained, I think it sounds like the analysis of the differences is more specified and more clear. Mm. Okay. Yes. And 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 if it is clear and and detailed, what does it help the business do? Yes, go on. I think at the time of manufacturing, you know, costs are uh, actually accounted for reactively. That means at the end of the period, while the manufacturing takes place uniformly during the month, and the, and we don't have those actual costs on end. So having a standard cost actually helps to evaluate the business till the end of the month or the production. So you don't have to stop production because you don't know your costs. So towards mm. the end of the month, you can apply the actuals to what you've already produced in order to get your variances. I like that. So it gives you like an, a realistic estimation of where you will end off at the end of the month, right? But by the time the end of the month comes and then you see what was actually spent, you can then have that those necessary discussions as to why are you falling short? Why are you overhead? But at least it was a realistic estimation as to where you will end off the month at, right? So some of the advantages, please note, you see the theory that we are covering. Some of the questions, remember I told you that each topic is, is asked differently. So you might have a question that asks you to calculate the standard quantity and rate. Right? You might be asked, why do you see your variances, which is the theory that we covered. Then you might be also asked, what the disadvantages and advantages of standard costs are. So try to make sure that you cover the theory and you understand it. Because it's a build up that can be just discussed or asked differently. So some of the advantages and disadvantages are as follows. Advantage, you improve your cost control and performance evaluation. You set the standards, then you can highlight those variances and investigate why you perform the way that you did, right? Um, the information from standard costing helps you to plan and make decision making, makes those decisions because uh, you have a more accurate budget. So you can plan and you can make decisions. There's chances that you can be able to reduce your spending, your production costs. After observing, because remember I told you observing the process is very important, you will start seeing whether your employees are cost conscious or do they just spend or they just they just come to work to chill. You can see certain methods that actually by using this machine, we lose out on a lot of material uh, during the inspection or this machine actually can't produce the 10,000 t-shirts that it promised. Maybe there's a more advanced machine that you can buy. So standard costing helps you to improve your process, your costs, and even evaluating the performance of your employees. Okay. Your disadvantages is that overhead variances are not well understood. Some people don't understand. Certain variances, workers may not report negative exceptions, which happens, right? 
some people, because this system is so detailed, you find that your your managers might hide it from you because it's so specific and detailed that it can pinpoint where they fell short. All right. So that's standard costing. And also low morale of some workers might be too evident from your standard costing. Um, because low morale of some workers, uh, what, you might end up focusing too much on the unfavorable variances of workers. Workers are human beings. Sometimes they don't like always being pinpointed where they are wrong. When you keep on pinpointing where they are wrong, they end up doing what? End up not wanting to work at at all. And that might end up affecting the people who are performing well. Because people who are performing well, when they see others end up not wanting to work at all, they end up also not working. Okay. So um, that's standard costing. I think I would leave it here for today. Um, then next time when we meet, we will do variance analysis so that I don't bombard you with so many factors. So now when you get to the varial variance, sorry, variance analysis, that's where now we are doing the calculations. We are now coming up with the reasons for those variances. We are getting to the crux of standard costing, but it was very important that you understand what informs the standard cost card. What does it actually, what amount of work go through in order to come up with that standard? Understand what a flex budget is, understand the disadvantages and, advan and advantages of using standard costing system as opposed to a budget. So understanding the basics will help you that by the time when we do the variance analysis, you're up to speed. Okay.